Hey classes, welcome back. We covered a lot of ground today and so I'm going to try and fly through it in my usual roughly 10 minutes of uh, kind of a recap of our notes today. So let's jump right in. As you know, if you've been checking out, for example, CNN 10 in your social studies classes over there, there was a big oil spill off the coast of California today and that was kind of our jumping off point because we were talking a little bit about oil in terms of two things. One, density floats on the water and two, of course, its impact on the environment right now. Now the oil is staying at the surface and when you have oil floating on the surface and as the seabirds go through that oil, gets onto their feathers among other things, it reduces their ability to stay warm and it does just a number on the sea life that is down below the surface as well, but it's certainly killing a number of birds off the coast of Los Angeles right now, which is something that definitely should have been avoided. Um, I start off by talking about my time working for an oil company. I used to work locally for oil, uh, for the oil company Chevron, and I want to talk just a little bit about oil refining, what it is we do with oil, and how it relates to exactly what we're doing this week along with the biggest little farm and learning a tiny bit about the book uh, by Rachel Carson called, if I can pick it up here, Silent Spring. So let's jump on in. First of all, oil refining. You may, if you've been up to say Vallejo, Richmond, any of the places around the Bay Area where we have an oil refinery, you see these giant tanks and stacks and pipes all over the place. Yeah, they look complicated, but it's really not that complicated at its heart. You pull the oil out of the ground and when you pump it over to a refinery like this, and I sketched the one over in Richmond right here, basically you've got these big tanks and you heat it up. Now there's different grades of oil. For example, when you heat it up and you do it by density, remember we had density a little while back, when you check out the density of the oil that's on top, those tend to be the lighter ones, uh, butanes and things like that. When you see the thicker stuff at the bottom, and again, I'm way oversimplifying, but the thicker stuff at the bottom tends to be like the dark oil that you'd see like in a crankcase of a car. Even asphalt comes out of this. We make asphalt for roads from oil compounds, from the compounds we found in oil, I should say. And then the middle layer roughly would be the gasoline you put in a traditional gas powered car. So when we're talking oil, that's what a refinery does. To get it to the refinery, it is either sometimes shipped in or in the case of offshore oil rigs, pumped in. And when we're doing that sort of thing, like the accident that they just had off the coast of LA, somebody seriously dropped the ball in terms of the second an, a, one of these pipes is breached, it should sound alarms when oil uh, at one end of the pipeline is suddenly not at the pressure it should be based on what went into the first end of the pipeline. So that's what, something to watch over the next uh, couple of days, why this happened and how to prevent this happening in the future. Uh, we're also talking about oil in terms of some of the compounds we get from it. Now, when you're looking at oil compounds, it's basically, just a whole bunch of carbons linked together. We've talked about carbons already. Carbon is the star of the show, as Neil deGrasse Tyson said, when it comes to the compounds that make life important. Remember, Chon, C-H-O-N-N, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Carbon is the one that can make these long chains and link together. So we're gonna get back to that in just a second. Right now, we jumped in at the very beginning of the class talking a little bit, and it happened to just fit into our lesson plan today that it worked out this way. Rachel Carson and Silent Spring. Back in 1962, this book came out and it really was the beginning in a lot of ways of the environmental movement. Rachel Carson was sounding the alarm about spreading DDT. And we're gonna talk a little bit about this compound in particular, but DDT, an offshoot of the petroleum industry, uh, in the environment, which was meant to kill bugs that transmit diseases. For example, specifically insects like the mosquito. Now, it's important to notice and to note that the intention was good. If you look at one of the uh, questions we used to use at the beginning of classes all the time when we were talking about habitats and nature, one of them we used a couple years ago was what animal is responsible for more human death than any other uh, every year and you know students sometimes guess things like oh snakes or sharks or you know deadly spiders uh, No, it is the mosquito if you consider that the mosquitoes transmit things like malaria and a number of parasitic diseases and viral diseases around the world That being said the intention of spraying DDT was good in the case of Rachel Carson's book She was talking about a disease also that tracked uh, attacked elm trees that was spread by a particular type of lice or mite 
DDT, it turns out, had been discovered way back in the 19th century. Actually, actually, it's kind of sat on the shelf for a while before they realized that it could kill insects. It kills insects and bugs by interfering with their nervous system. When it does this, the intent was, okay, let's spray it not only on trees and things to prevent mosquito infestations. Uh, literally, they would drive down the streets of America with clouds of DDT coming out of the backs of trucks. Kids would run out and say, oh, look, the, the misting truck is coming. It looked like a bunch of fog or snow coming out of the back of the truck, and they would literally play in this stuff. Um, Rachel Carson noticed that the birds that used to inhabit the Michigan University campus where she attended uh, were dying off at an alarming rate, and it has to do with exactly something that we learned in this class a little while back. The unintended side effect uh, that of killing the birds was because of something that we've seen in here before called bioaccumulation. When we go back to this one again, when we were talking a little bit with some of the pictures on the board in class, we used this particular drawing that we've seen before where you have a number of uh, producers at the bottom of a food pyramid. The producers, remember, the photosynthesizers mainly. And as you work your way up the food pyramid, you go to fewer and fewer organisms, and as a result of that, things that are toxic in the environment get concentrated as you go up the food pyramid. In the case of DDT, you're talking about a poison that, yes, it was deadly to bugs at the bottom of the, of the, of the food pyramid, pyramid, but as it works its way up, it is getting more and more concentrated as you move towards the top, the apex predators, the primary and the secondary carnivores. Now, when you're looking at the chemical itself, uh, dichloral, diphenyl, trichloroethane, again, just a little tiny tidbit from my time at Chevron Corporation, my job at the corporation at that time was to work with some of the chemists in putting together the formulas that they would use and send out to other refineries, say, hey, this is the type of oil, this is the type of blend we're making right now. I worked with a team that did this. Um, when you look at something like that, it might seem very, very intimidating. It's not. Really, when you're looking at a long thing like this, it's really not difficult at all when you start at the end and you work backward. When you're talking the ethane, you're just talking a couple of carbons linked together. The aims tell you how many are linked together, and I won't go through the whole thing, but the intent is to make it a little less scary for you because I want you all to look at science and engineering and chemistry as a possible career choice because it's awesomely cool, the things that you get to do with it. In this case right here, ethane is just two carbons linked together. Trichloro, you can probably figure that out because we're gonna break some things down in class all the time in terms of finding the root words. We'll do that again here in a second with the gastropods. But if you look at the trichloroethane, it tells you how many chlorines are linked to that. Moving this way, the reason for these long names is simply it tells the chemist how this particular compound is put together. That's all. It's really, really a simple naming system when you actually get into the organic chemistry of how we name things like this. The point being, being ethane, being a couple of carbon compounds, the chemical industry was, uh, that builds things like pesticides was built really from the, the petroleum industry where we pull the oil out of the ground. And we're seeing the petroleum industry right now under the scrutiny down here in Southern California as oil is washing up on the shore around Huntington Beach and they're trying to deal with seabirds and sea life that have been adversely affected by the mismanagement of some of the oil pipelines that bring in the carbon compounds offshore. Now we use oil all the time. It's the basis of our economy. And this is really showing how we have to have really good scrutiny and oversight so that we can protect our environment from the oil that floats on the surface. All right, from there we moved on in to, let me pull up this one over here, our local species of the day. Uh, one of the most awesome things you can do to really get an appreciation for the species is get to know their names. One of the things that's a seventh grade standard, uh, besides the naming of carbon compounds, is knowing the scientific name of some of the species that you see. And we're doing things that we see right here on campus. Yesterday we had Canis latrans, which of course is the coyote. Coyote has been seen out here eating the gophers. Uh, we had, uh, let me think, we had Armadilla, Armadilla, Armadilla de vulgaris, which was the 
roly polies. Incidentally, a bug that came all the way from Europe. It's not a native. And this one right here, we've got the red tailed hawk, uh, Boeto uh, jamaicensis. And if you check out the red tailed hawk, this was one of the birds that was affected by the DDT. When they started realizing that DDT was causing a problem in our environment, um, at first, Rachel Carson was vilified by some chemical companies. She was attacked uh, fairly viciously by a lot of companies and people who tried to discredit her, not so much going after the book even, but they were going after her personally to try and discredit what was in this, this book. Um, fortunately, it didn't work. Fortunately, she's become sort of a hero of the environmental movement. And when you look at what its effect is on birds in particular, uh, the bird eggs of particularly things like predators like this would be so thin that they would fall apart in the, ne in the nest. Local tie-in also with the peregrine falcons. You may or may not know that right here on the south side of town by the Old Devil Slide Trail, it used to be the highway one that used to wind around Devil Slide over there. Now it's closed uh, to cars and you can of course walk and bike that trail. There is a nesting pair of peregrine falcons up there awesome bird by the way and the peregrine falcons were another one of these birds that was uh, in trouble because of the DDT in the environment the DDT would make the shells very very thin and again they wouldn't be able to have um, the hatchlings survive because the shells would literally break inside the nest um, while we're watching the biggest little farm today the last little thing I'll talk about and then the tie-in with all of this to what we're checking out is in the farm that you're seeing Molly and John uh, trying to run down there just north of Los Angeles. And again, I encourage you to watch the whole movie. We're only watching little snippets of it. We're not going to have time to check out the whole thing. I just pull out little bits so that we can illustrate some of the things from the text. And when we're checking out the snails that start invading the farm, uh, gastropods, this is another ch chance for us to check out in biology how very, very often we break words into their pieces to figure out what they mean. Gastro means stomach, pods uh, meaning foot, stomach, foot, gastropods, the snails crawling along. Um, the gastropods were really doing a number on their farm in terms of the things that they were eating. They were going after the cover crops, they were going after the citrus trees, but it turned out biodiversity came to the rescue. Um, biodiversity in the form of the duck pond that they had going on with the duck pond being unfortunately overtaken by algae because of the California drought. They're like, what do we feed and what do we do with these ducks that are hanging out here needing something to eat and not having a good pond to uh, stay in anymore? They turn loose the ducks on the orchards and the ducks were eating the gastropods like crazy. As a matter of fact, John in the movie estimated that each duck, or all the ducks, excuse me, ate about 90 thousand snails that first year that they turned them loose and I believe that was year three of the farm. So we'll talk about gastropods in more detail. Uh, shout out to one of the best scientists I've ever ever met, a lady by the name of Katie Shopoff, one of the best science teachers I've ever ever known in the history of science teachers. We used to collect the snails over at Parkside School in San Bruno. Uh, we would have everything from snail races to check out their average weights and things like this. And a quick funny thing, a quick funny funny story was we collected all the gastropods. I put them in a fish tank to keep in the classroom on a Friday. Came back on Monday because we were going to be looking at the gastropods and we'd always turn them loose at the end of the uh, experiments and the, and the fun that we have learning from them. And of course, Mr. Brilliant Forbes here, I put a piece of cardboard over the top of the fish tank, large tank, thinking, well, that'll keep them in over the weekend. Uh, what is cardboard made from? Tree material, uh, plants, and paper is made, of course, from uh, you know, the pulp of plants. And then the snails quickly ate through the cardboard. We came in on a Monday to the Parkside classroom, snails all over the place. So that one was on me. Um, if you check out the gastropods there in the farm, uh, they, are, they are kept in check by the ducks, and they still are. You can actually visit this farm. It's just north of Los Angeles. I'll put that down in the links below. Uh, but the gastropods are still kept in check by the ducks. It turns out uh, ducks love to eat snails. So a quick shout out there to Miss Katie Shopoff over at uh, Parkside School. But if you're checking out everything here, 
we're trying to show, we're trying to teach about. If you look at chapter four of our book, that's exactly what we talk about. We start with carbon compounds. We refine carbon compounds all the time. It really is the basis for our economy in terms of where we generate electricity, how we run cars. We also use carbon compounds to make certain pesticides. Some of these pesticides we have to be extraordinarily careful with because one of the unintended consequences of using DDT was to have it bioaccumulate, cause a lot of problems with things higher up in the food pyramid. And I would highly recommend, although we are gonna check out certain excerpts from it, we certainly don't have time to read the whole book in class. I would highly, highly recommend Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, uh, written in 1962. It really is the hallmark, the benchmark book for the environmental movement in the United States. And it really is a wonderful example of how our actions have a tremendous impact beyond our local environment. They have a huge impact on the entire world. That's where we'll leave it today. Have a great uh, Wednesday, and we'll see you back online. Bye-bye.